Welcome back. This is week 11, lecture two, which is not really a lecture, uh, but it's helping you or designed to help you prepare uh, for the second midterm. Um, now I gave this kind of a talk or lecture preparing for midterm one. Uh, and this is the same type of talk. So there's no PowerPoint presentation for this lecture slash talk. It's simply me talking, going through with you the exam, what's expected, and all those types of things. As I think I said before, in terms of preparing for midterm one talk or lecture, um, this is kind of designed as, as I would do in an in-person class, in a review session, getting ready for the exam. Um, so that's what this is intended to be, and I hope it will help. Now, exam midterm two, exam midterm two, um, covers weeks six through 11, and it covers all the course material, what's assigned in the textbook readings, the source readings, and the lectures. That is what comprises the course material. And as I have said several times, I think, and also as is clearly stated in the introduction to the course document, um, and I believe on the exam itself, the basis for grading your exam is how well you apply the course material to the given lecture. Now, there's a lot in the course material. Um, there is. I know that. And you can't present all of it. But what the, the, you need to do is say, okay, based on all of this course material, the textbook, the lectures, and the assigned readings, what do I bring from that whole, all of it, to answer the given question for, you know, that I had before me? How do I make my case? What do I bring as evidence for answering the question? And how do I formulate an argument? supported with the evidence, with the evidence being the course material. Now, you've already taken midterm one, um, if you've gotten to this point, I'm assuming. Um, and as I'm recording this lecture, um, certainly not everyone has submitted midterm one uh, at this point. Those of you who, who have, some of you did very well, um, others not so well. And uh, I've given feedback, of course, on everyone's exam. Um, and those of you who did not so well, that's basically the, the, the problem is the course material and what you bring to it. Now, I'll be going through the exam with you shortly, but the terms to know for midterm two um, is a guide. And especially on part two, the essay for part two, you should try to incorporate as many of those terms as you can. Now, as I said before, I believe, um, I don't grade based on quantification. So it's not like I sit and have the terms to know for midterm two next to the computers. I'm grading your exam. Do I start checking off and see what percentage of those terms you include and which ones you don't? That's not the point of this. So don't feel stressed because, oh, how do I fit these terms in? But that gives you a guide in terms of what I expect you to know, to be able to deal with based on the course material. So use the terms to know as a guide as you're preparing to write your exam. And I must, would hope that you would make an outline of your question, of your answer, that is, to the question. Because that will really help formulate and structure how you're going to approach answering the question. What position you're going to take, or your thesis, and then what evidence you're going to bring to support that thesis. So it might be a good idea, too, to review the document historical argument. because. That's also very important in terms of how your exam is going to be graded by me, is how will you formulate an argument. I've said, I think repeatedly, I'm not going to grade your opinion. For example, let's say, let's say, you know, my opinion is, you know, the, the Hitler and the Nazis were wrong. They're horrible people. And it was great that the West stood up to them and defeated them. Great. That's your opinion. Now, certainly, it's an opinion I share. I think probably we all do. But I'm not going to grade that just because I agree with it. You have to formulate an argument for why that was the case. Why was it important to defend the West against Hitler? What led to that? What were the various factors that allowed the West to do so? What brought that about? Now, that's not the question, obviously, that we're asking. So I'll go through with you 
both parts one and two, in terms of how do we bring material from the course material and apply it to the question based on presenting evidence for your position, your thesis. Now, if you've you know, again, look at the historical argument document. Again, um, I relate historical argument to legal argument. You are presenting a case. The case is the question itself. You have to look at the evidence, the course material, sift through it, analyze it, say, what do I bring from all this evidence that will support my position, i.e., where do you stand on the question? There is, again, as I've said before, um, there's no right or wrong answers. There are good answers and bad answers, but no right or wrong answers. You can get things right or wrong. But the answer itself, the position you take, there's not a right or wrong answer to that. What makes it for a good answer or a bad answer is how well you use the course material to apply to the question and present your evidence. How strong is your case? Which means, too, if there's any um, evidence that might undermine your position, you, have, you can't just ignore it. You have to deal with it. And you have to try to show how it does not really take away from your argument and your perspective. That I can grade in terms of how well you understand, assimilate, analyze, and use the course material to answer the question. Okay? Now, if you have questions about that, again, please send me an email and ask. Um, but in terms of what you're responsible for, you're responsible for everything that's been assigned and presented from week 6 to 11. Um, that's on the syllabus. And the syllabus, again, is that printed document and course documents. Given that, okay, um, let's now go through kind of the exam um, and what's expected. How can you approach it? Um, how do you formulate an argument? What can you bring in? And what should you bring in um, as we go through this? Okay, so I have up here midterm two. Um, and as I'm reading this, I see I screwed up as I was um, redoing this uh, exam for this course. I mean, I've taught this before. Um, and so I start based on, you know, what I've done before, revise it. I've revised it a significant amount. But there is a very poorly phrased um, sentence at the very beginning of midterm two based on my cutting and pasting and not going back and revising. That is, you know, the midterm exam consists of two sections. Yes, it does. In part one, you are to write short essays on each the, on each the given question, which makes no sense. Should be a short essay on the given question, which focuses on the analysis of one of the assigned source readings. Uh, I'm not going to explain how that is there and why that was there. Um, if you're interested, it's just I used to have a different format for part one with different terms and little shorter essays. That's my mistake in terms of not going back and realizing that I needed to update, so to speak, that description um, in, in that fashion, too. But anyway, that's neither here nor there. I hope it's not confusing. That's why the only thing, the reason I mention it here, I hope it doesn't confuse your essays. There's one essay in part two. This is there was for the midterm one. So let's look at that first essay in part two. It's worth 40 points, so 40% of your exam. Um, and it is as follows. What does Olympe de Gouges' Declaration of the Rights of Woman and of Citizen evidence for evaluating the assertion of human rights in the later 18th century and beyond? How does it compare with the Declaration of the Rights of Man and of Citizen? Or perhaps, in other words, did women have an enlightenment? Or were enlightenment ideals simply intended for men, whereby then, too, human rights were not human rights, but male rights, and male property owners' rights, as slaves too were excluded. How can we understand the seeming contradictions between the ideals and the political realities of modern Europe? Now, that last question, in some ways, is really what it's getting at. I mean, as you know from already from midterm one, um, the questions I ask for, on the essays, both in part one and part two, are rather complex with different parts and sub-questions involved. So I kind of try to give you the frame. Within that frame, what's the real core of the question? The real core of the question here is, 
Um, how can we understand the seeming contradictions between the ideals and the political realities of modern Europe? Now, your answer to that question will be important, too, for answering the essay in part two, which I'll get to when we get there. Um, and also, uh, both of these questions, part one and part two, will be important for your answering the final essay, the final exam, which is one essay. And so you might even want to think about taking a look at that final essay, if you haven't already, the final exam, um, to see how this can help play into that. That is why, too, I said uh, all along that the final exam is comprehensive. And I'll be giving another lecture on preparing for the final exam, or talk about preparing for the final exam when we get there. Um, but it's a comprehensive exam, so it examines or tests your understanding and grasp and knowledge of the whole course material and how well you apply it to the question. But the focus is on human rights. So this is kind of a, a pre-exam exam for the question that you're going to have to be answering for your final. In terms of grading two, as I've said, your score on the final, if it is a higher score percentage-wise than your scores on one or two in the midterms, your final score will be placed percentage-wise your midterm scores. Because the midterms are designed to help prepare for writing the final essay, the final exam, which is what really I think is the most important, is what you leave the course with, so to speak. What is your level of understanding and knowledge at the end of the course, more than it is you know, busy work throughout the semester? That's the context. Um, so with that perspective, let's go back and look at then question one and part one of your second midterm. As I just said, the core of it is how can we understand the seeming contradictions between the ideals and the political realities of modern Europe? Now, Olympe de Gouges' Declaration of the Rights of Women and a Citizen is one of the, the assigned texts, one of the assigned sources, as is the Declaration of the Rights of Man and a Citizen. Those seemingly are the same, and there's a lot of overlap. Why? And well, what happened, and what was the response to Olympe de Gouges? Did the Declaration of the Rights of Women and a Citizen become a foundational document for France and the concept of, of human rights within France during the French Revolution and thereafter? Or was it rejected? Now, the question, I said, it says, or perhaps, in other words, did women have an enlightenment? That um, is from a very famous essay, uh, Joan Wallace, Wallach Scott, uh, Did Women Have a Renaissance? And that goes back you know, to the 70s, I think it was when it was written, written in terms of, you know, all this discussion about the Renaissance, what was it, was it this flourishing period, blah, blah, blah. And her question was, yeah, but did that really apply to women? That's, I'm taking that concept and saying with the Enlightenment, which also has been seen as, you know, modernity and great, we're all enlightened people, blah, 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 blah. Were the ideals of the Enlightenment also applied to women? And with the reaction to Olympe de Gouges, and her Declaration of the Rights of Women and a Citizen, I would say that's difficult to argue that it was. Now, you could say that, as long as you understand what was going on and what happened to her, which I had talked about in lectures and so. You could say, well, it might seem that it didn't, but overall, it led to, eventually, women being included. Now, you could say that. Or you could say, no, it was not. It was strictly a male development, and women and slaves and children were, by definition, excluded and not allowed to have an enlightenment. Neither position, as such, is right or wrong. It is a basis of how do you formulate your argument in light of the course material. What would not be a good way to go about it would be to say, Olympe de Gouges' Declaration of the Rights of Women and of Citizens shows that women were arguing for equal rights just as were men, and we see this as a continuous progression up until all of the um, suffragist uh, movements, which there's a slide in the lectures talking about women's suffrages after World War I. So we see this steady progression of the rights of women, and it begins with Olympe de Gouges. Okay, well, what about the evidence on the contrary? 
the fact that she was beheaded for treason, for example, because of this treatise. Um, what about still the whole issue of slavery and place of women, the fact that they didn't have rights to vote, um, and then what led to their you know, suffrage uh, after World War II. So those are the kinds of issues that this is trying to get at. So how you'd go about it is, first of all, to give a compare and contrast section on the text itself. What is What did Olympe de Gouges argue? And what were the, the similarities to the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen? What were the differences? What was the context? How do we put it all together? And then in the broader question, then, that gets back to then the ideals. How can we understand the seeming contradictions? Because I said seeming contradictions, because there seem, to me, there seems to be a contradiction between Olympe de Gouges' Declaration of the Rights of Women and Citizen, what she's arguing, and then the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen. Because all of a sudden it's like, it's not human beings that we're talking about, we're talking about males. Doesn't that seem to be a contradiction? If so, how so? If not, why not? So how can we understand that seeming contradiction, which means if there is a contradiction, and you can say there isn't, but then you have to make your case. You just can't assume and say, well, my view and my opinion is that there were no contradictions. Oh, yeah. Why? Because it would seem that there is, and it seems that the course material, the assigned documents, indicate that. So how would you counter that position? Now, and how would you use, not your own opinion, but the course material? to counter that position, that there were, is, was not a contradiction between ideals and the political realities. You could do so. It might be difficult, but you could do so. That is what this question is getting at. How do we understand this assertion of human rights as we've seen first starting with John Locke? So somehow John Locke should be in there. The Declaration of Independence, which too was one of the assigned sources even though it's not explicitly mentioned in the question, um, to deal with how we understand this thing that historians have termed the Enlightenment, and that was talked about at the time, as I think uh, we, I, I mentioned, it was Immanuel Kant's argument that what, does, what is Enlightenment, it's like, okay, what is it and how do we deal with it? That's what this is getting at. It's like, how do we understand this period of the beginnings of the emergence of asserting human rights as what? As a basis for revolution. Because Locke is writing in the context of the Glorious Revolution in England. The Declaration of Independence is a revolutionary document. So is the Declaration of the Rights of Man and of Citizen is a re revolutionary document in terms of the French Revolution. Then we get the reaction with Olympe de Gouges asserting her position in, in the, kind of the context of the reign of terror after the first part of the French Revolution. That, that is not down. She's beheaded for treason and like, no, we're not doing that. So how do we understand that? And you can even point forward to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights which, too, is part of the course material for weeks 6 through 11, where it is very explicitly stated men and women both have these rights. Every human being has these rights. So you couldn't kind of give this broad scope of the development of human rights from, let's say, Locke to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And what is the context and what were the struggles and is there a contradiction? Even with the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, we have these assertions. What was the reality? Now, part one really focuses on this context of the late 18th, early 19th century, Olympe de Gouges, Declaration of Rights of a Man and a Citizen. You will need to present the evidence, and that means, too, citing from the texts themselves. Not just talking about them, saying, here's the evidence. Olympe de Gouges is asserting nothing that was not asserted in the Declaration of the Rights of Man, but just saying, but women too have these rights. And women too should be citizens and seen as human beings. Because it's not clear what Declaration of the Rights of Man in this time period, what is that referring to? Is it the universal, not you know, non inclusive, general human being? Or is it specifically male? And that's the same problem we have with the Declaration of Independence. All men are created equal. 
Really? Does it mean all men? All human beings? Or all males? Or all property, free property males are created equal? Same thing with kind of law, the right to life, liberty, and property. Who has the right to property? Did women have the right to property? No. Do slaves have the right to property? No. Do they have the right to life or liberty? No. So what is really going on in these declarations of human rights? And how does that help us understand the period in which they develop? What does it reveal about the period? And that gets, goes back then to that first part of the question um, in terms of what does it evidence for evaluating the assertion of human rights in the later 18th century and beyond. That just means what does it reveal? What does it tell us? Based on the analysis of the text itself, what does this text tell us about kind of the history of human rights or the history and the assertion of human rights in early modernity or even late early modernity to the, the transition to modern Europe and on we go. So that is really kind of trying to break down what this question is getting at and what it's asking you to do. It's asking you to answer the question, how can we understand the seeming contradictions between the ideals and the political realities of modern Europe? But to do that, based on analyzing Olympe de Declaration of the Rights of Women and in comparison and contrast with the Declaration of the Rights of Man and of Citizen. And what does that say about human rights and the place of women within that? I hope that really helps. If it doesn't, please email me, because I'm not sure what more I can say at this point. Um, and we can go over it further. But that's kind of what is behind that question. Now, I've already mentioned here Locke and the Declaration of Independence. Those, I would expect, would at least be mentioned in your essay. But remember, you're presenting a case to court. So you want to be hard-hitting. You want to present a thesis. Your thesis is what... It, you know, is your answer to, you know, what, how do we understand the, the seeming contradictions? What was that? And then you present the evidence. Does that help? I hope so. Again, if it doesn't, please email me to ask and we can go through it individually or whatever. But that's question one or part one of your essay. And that should help with then answering the question in part two. And part two is a more general essay. Um, it's expected to be lo longer and more extensive in terms of your answer and um, really gets at all of the course material in a way that the first question is more focused and specific. Because here we have this, uh, the question is as such. The ideals of the Enlightenment served as the basis for what became known as the Age of Revolutions. From the American and French revolutions to the revolutions of 1848 and on into w World War I, the Russian Revolution of World War II, Europe and indeed, quote-unquote, the West was in a state of almost constant war. Such violence led eventually to the breakup of the British and Ottoman empires. All such revolutions and wars, though, were based on ideological programs that in many ways can be traced back to the Enlightenment. Based on the political, social, and economic development of the West from approximately 1770 to approximately 1960, how would you evaluate the impact of the Enlightenment? If, the Enlightenment, if in the Enlightenment we find the first articulations of human rights, has, how successful was the West in recognizing, enforcing, and following human rights? Does not the political, religious, social, and economic history of the West during this period simply contradict, if not negate, the ideals of the Enlightenment and of human rights? Why or why not? Be sure to base your answer on the course material, namely the textbook, the lectures, and the assignment readings. Boom. Now, that again is a, rather a wazoo question. What is the basis of it? The focus and the basis is, here we have it, Based on the political, social, and economic development of the West from approximately 1770 to 1960, how would you evaluate the impact of the Enlightenment? That's the question. How would you impact, evaluate the impact of the Enlightenment on the development of modern Europe? Is really what it's getting at. During this chronological period, 1770 to 1960, approximately on both sides. Now, that is not then restricted to, quote-unquote, 
the Enlightenment. And it's not restricted to revolutions. And say, so, yeah, but World War I wasn't a revolution. World War II wasn't a revolution. But it's saying revolutions and constant war because there are conflicts. The Russian Revolution was a rough Russian Revolution. And it led to the establishment of the Soviet Union, which became this ideological construct opposing and in conflict with the Western construct ideology of democratic capitalism. So there we have Marx, we have the revolutions of 1848, we have the whole kind of shebang leading to this con this emergence of the two superpowers, as I talked about in last lecture. And then what does, you know, human rights, if we're talking about human rights, what does that have to do with the Jews and the Arabs in Palestine? What does that have to do when they are both appealing to human rights and their own human rights in the broader context of the entire history? What does that have to do with you know World War One and World War Two, where human rights being acknowledged and upheld in those wars? Within World War One, the trench warfare, the gas, and everything else in World War Two, you know the, the problems there, including the atomic bomb. Isn't those realities? And even you say, well, that's just the reality of war, and yes, it is. Because it isn't don't isn't doesn't the reality of war? contradict appeals to human rights and the dignity of human beings. That's what it's kind of getting at, okay? And so when we look at this, how do we bring all the course material to this? So it, you can kind of divide it into three different sections. Let's say the transition from early modern to modern Europe, which is at Kirk of 1770, so you know, prior to, just prior to, the American Revolution and then the French Revolution. Up until then, the, then 1960, which is kind of on the cusp of what we'll be talking about after the midterm postmodernity, even though I've already in the lectures indicated that there are certainly developments um, with from about 1905, anyway, let's say, with the with Einstein and things that show and talk about, we can start seeing, looking back about, oh, the modern paradigm is beginning to crumble. And what comes next? And I'll be talking about that, what comes next after this midterm, but we can already see the problems involved and the kind of like what's really going on here. So that is what is going on. From the cusp of modernity, so we're still in late early, mo early modern Europe in 1770, to the cusp of postmodernism, more kind of full-blown than just the beginning inklings and beginnings of the chipping away at the modern paradigm. That's the chronological frame. And so it's like, how did these ideals of the Enlightenment, which seem to be so important, reason, the nation state, um, human rights, how did they impact this development? And is it not simply a contradiction? How do we understand what's going on? Because if it's simply a, a, a contradiction, what is the point of upholding human rights? Is something else behind that going on? What are the ideological structures that, again, allow us to create meaning? That's what this course is about. It's about understanding meaning and how does the past develop meaning? How is meaning attributed to it? And what does it all mean for us today? And how can we understand our own lives and place in the world based on the historical development. That's what this course is about. So this question, and that's what your kind of final exam is, is asked, will be asking. But here it's like, okay, we take this issue of the Enlightenment and human rights. Part one is focused on Olympe de Gouges and the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen. This question is the whole shebang, so to speak. How does this impact this development as we go from kind of the cusp of the transition, or the, not the cusp of the transition, but the transition period from early modern to modern Europe, and then on the cusp of the transition from modern Europe to postmodern. What was going on? What were the events that challenged at the time for the Europeans themselves? That's what I talk about World War I being such a shock and World War II being such a shock. It's like, how could this have happened? And how can we prevent it from happening again? And what was the answer? Well, one of the answers was the Declaration of the, or of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So that document, which was a site, needs to be fairly central in your answer, as well as the 
previous assertions of human rights in U.S. You know, the the Declaration of Independence, the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen, and then Olympe de Gouges, again, don't simply refer back to Part One of your answer. Don't say why, well, as I said there, and bring all that again new. And if you need to cut and paste your own answer, you can do that. You can cut and paste material from your own answer in Part One to use again in your answer to Part Two. Keep in mind, too, the page lengths are minimums, and there's no maximum. If you turned in a 50-page exam, that would not be a negative, unless it was just 50 pages of, you know, quotation from the textbook or from the lectures or from some, you know, the internet or someplace else, or just complete irrelevant material. If it's all relevant in terms of you presenting the, the evidence to support your position and your argument, that would be great. So don't feel that you like, oh my gosh, I'm going to go over, you know, the, the page limit. Um, don't worry about that whatsoever. And the minimums are like a theoretical minimum. Could you get a, you know, an A on part one of the exam if you write, you know, a two and a half page essay? I think probably that might be possible. But it'd have to be very concise, very focused. The same with part two with the four to six, I think it is, pages. Is that what it, what it says there? I'll have to go back and look here. Um, four to six pages as a minimum for part two. So that's kind of what we're looking at. Uh, don't worry at all about the minimums. Um, unless you write you know, a page for part one and don't know what else to write and don't feel that you don't have anything else to say, that could be a problem. The same with you know part two. If you write two pages and think, I'm done, I don't know what else to say, that will be a problem. Because there's a lot of material. You have to remember that you are trying to convince me, the judge. You can't assume things. You have to build up your case. And you can't just refer to things. You have to prove it. You see, as seen in you know, the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen, no, tell me where. As seen in the Declaration of the Rights of Man and of Citizen, when the text states, quote, boom. That's what I'm getting at. Present your evidence. Or, important for the development of human rights was Marx's theories of communism. You say, well, that's not right. Communism, as we know it, completely denies human rights. Keep in mind the distinction I tried to draw between Marx and his understanding of communism based on his writings, and then Lenin and Stalin and how they tried to enforce it and impose it. You say, Hitler was advocating for human rights, was he not? At least for the German workers. There's a distinction between, again, the ideals and then the implementation, trying to make those ideals into reality. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to say Hitler was a great advocate for human rights. Obviously, clearly, absolutely not. But especially as he's coming into power and becomes voted into power, he does so based on a platform, which I talked about, this populist nationalism for the Germans in the context of the you know, post-World War I period, the Great Depression, and on we go. He's trying to argue for the rights of the German workers, and they loved it. That's what this is getting at. What you know, the, the the assertions and then the realities. Now, with Hitler, we can kind of say, okay, yeah, but he always knew that there were problems. Well, he knew that there were problems. Anti-Semitism had been a problem all along, and so when he got to the final solution, that was already kind of prepared, already in Mein Kampf into the whole history of anti-Semitism in, in the West, but it's particularly in Germany. But with Marx, there's really the, uh, a difference because he's really coming out of the context of the Enlightenment and the Age of Revolution. And his ideals are for the rights of everyone, the equality, the classless society. When we don't have this opposition between the haves and the have-nots and the exploitation of some human beings by other human beings. 
And Marx's solution was the only way that's ever going to come about is if we come to class consciousness to bring about the proletariat revolution to lead to the classless society. And what does uh, Stalin and Lenin do? Or Lenin and Stalin? They say, we're not going to wait for that progression because for Marx, again, it was a theory of historical development. We're going to bring it about and impose it and force it. And that is where we start getting that then the crackdown on human rights because they don't want dissent because dissent is problematic. Human rights, in some ways, and the concept of human rights based on the liberal arts tradition have been behind every revolutionary movement. And we can say that how it was became into effect and put into practice with Hitler was horrible. We can say that, I mean, if you say horrible, explain that. Don't, I mean, again, that's not an academic term. That's not a ter that's an evaluative judgment. And with Lenin and Stalin, it didn't, didn't really work. No, because they, start, they re are repressing human rights in the name of theoretically trying to support human rights. Just as when Olympe de Gouges publishes her Declaration of the Rights of Women, and so that is based on the idea of supporting human rights, also for female human beings, and that is then practically excluded. So those are the tensions that I'm talking about, okay? So your kind of concluding argument in terms of your essay, if you have these different um, sections of the emergence of modernity out, uh, modernity out of early modernity, which includes the Industrial Revolution, because what's behind the Industrial Revolution, not only technological developments, but also the capitalistic theories of Adam Smith, the Industrial Revolution, so this emergence of modernity, the development of modernity, and then the Questioning the cusp of postmodernity after World War One and World War Two, and Europeans and people in the West are really thinking, "Now what? Is this really working? How do we deal with the problems and the contradictions?" Because what has happened? Constant war ever since. Is that what the Enlightenment leads to? Can we go beyond the Enlightenment, maybe, that will help in terms of ideological structures? Because if we're sitting here in around 1960, we're looking at the world and it's like, is this a safer world? We have these two superpowers threatening to destroy the entire planet, basically. Is that the result of the Enlightenment? Are there ways that we could understand and take the ideals of the Enlightenment and use them for, let's say, a better use than what had been had been made of them as it developed historically. So it's again, there's no right or wrong answer. It's a sophisticated question. It's a complex question. It's not about information. It's about how do you construct your analysis of the evidence to apply to the question and to present your case in an academic scholarly argument which again is not based on, I'm right, no you're not, yes I am, no, no. That's arguing maybe, but that's not an argument. An argument is based on the analysis of the evidence and how you present it so that the evidence supports the position you're, for which you're advocating. And I, as the judge, will be evaluating your argument based on the evidence. That's what this is all about. Now, I hope that kind of covers things. I hope that helps you as you're working on your midterm. Uh, again, I, I know I've said this before. I'll say it again. I'm happy to read drafts. Um, and I'll comment on drafts based on the uh, my ability to do so. Uh, you know, I've never had the case. I've never had the case where everybody sends me a draft like the night before. Uh, it's quote, unquote, due. I would never get to it. Um, and I'm not going to give, you know, I'm not going to rewrite it for you, but I can give general comments. You know, what about this? I think you need more evidence here. Um, what about this, these parts of the course material? So that's what we're looking at. And this midterm especially is designed 
to work, help you prepare for the final, which is not that far away. But don't worry about the final yet. Focus on getting this done and doing it as well as you possibly can. Proofread before you hit submit. Proofread before you hit submit. And make sure you submit the proper document. Remember, what you submit is represents yourself. I know I've said this before. It's like going to a job interview. You don't just throw on whatever is on the floor in terms of clothes and go in with, you know, whatever. You present yourself. And you take the time and care to present yourself. And when you submit an exam, you are presenting yourself. So make sure you try to factor that in in terms of your you know, drafting it, outlining it, drafting it, revising it, proofreading it, and submitting it. Because your grade does depend on it. Once again, if you have any questions, please just let me know. Um, I'm looking forward to reading your exams. I, I, I think, well, I think history in general is so exciting. But I think, in some ways, this course, even though it's not, especially where we are now, not my particular area of, of expertise, I think it's so exciting and important for understanding what's going on in our world today and understanding ourselves. So make the most of it. Use it. Make it your own, and present yourself based on your understanding analysis of the course material. If you have any questions, please just ask. I'm here to help, in my view, and I'll certainly will try. And good luck with it all. And try to have some fun with it, because I think it is fun. Is it easy? No, it's not easy. I know that. It's not supposed to be easy. You're supposed to struggle with it. That's what education is all about. That's what learning is about. That's what grow, growth and growing is all about. Struggle and wrestling with it all. And coming to a position of, ah, I think I get it. And then presenting that in your midterm. And then when you go to do the final, you'll be struggling with it all over again. <laughs> We're always seeking to come to an understanding. And it's only when we say, nope, I know it all. I'm not going to struggle anymore. I'm not going to question anymore. I know it all. That's not the approach to take. So try to enjoy and, and embrace the struggle of how do I understand this? How do I put it together? What can I involve? What can I bring in? How can I present my argument that will be most persuasive to me, the judge? based on the course material. Okay? Good luck. And uh, again, I'm looking forward to reading your exams. And uh, we, I'll see you again, so to speak, virtually in any way, after the exam, when we find uh, get to the last part of the course in the postmodernism, and we go from there. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.